Jackie Linsky, and I'm the local history librarian at the library. I would like to thank you all for joining us today for our presentation on the oldest houses of Rockport and Gloucester, given by none other than Prue Fish and sponsored by the Gloucester Lyceum. Prue Fish is a graduate of UMass Amherst and is a leading historian on historic homes in Gloucester and Rockport. Not only is she a historian, she's also an activist when it comes to saving old homes, both from destruction and well-intentioned, but perhaps misinformed renovations. Today, Prue is going to be talking about the wonderful historic homes you can find around Gloucester and Rockport, including histories of the families who have lived there and knowledge on their craftsmanship. Prue is a believer that talking about old homes and genealogy often go hand in hand. It is our hope that you leave the presentation with a wealth of knowledge you may not have known before. But before I pass it on to Prue, I would like to thank you all again for taking the time to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, I'm Prue Fish, and I'm passionate about old houses and saving them and restoring them. And not only that, in dating them correctly, we have a lot of old houses here. But on Cape Ann, the first period houses are from about, uh, let's say, 1680 to about 1730. That's called the first period, the first building period. And in Gloucester and Rockport, I've only found about 12 houses that are genuinely in, in that category. Uh, Ipswich, the town of Ipswich brags about having 59 as opposed to our 12. But um, I know, and I think some of the people over there know that a lot of theirs are, are misstated because they were, if switch was noted early on for having all of these old houses and they did not have all of the tools or the knowledge to date them. So they thought everything was ancient and everything was 1600s, which the, they really aren't. And so they, they kind of acknowledge that, but a lot of the signs uh, over there still say, I uh, have an early date. When I was a real estate broker over there, I sold a house that was uh, genuinely dated after 1709. But the date on the sign on the house said, I don't know, 1660 something or 1670. And I told the owner that that was not correct. And he didn't want to misrepresent the house. So he took it off the sign off and put it in the cellar under his workbench. And the house sold. And the next day that the sign went back up that had the early date on it and it's still there today. They've replaced it with a new sign, but the old date has prevailed even though it's off by quite a lot. Now the way they're dating the houses now is uh, quite interesting. It's called dendrochronology. And it's really a study of the tree rings. They have to find a uh, a beam in the house that goes out to the wany edge, uh, they call it, of the, the beam or the tree. In the, in all, well, everywhere all the time, uh, the tree rings and the trees change depending on the weather. If it's a, a wet season, uh, there's a big tree ring. If it's a drought, there's a very narrow tree ring. So by studying these, they get a pattern and they can, they can attach a date to a, a, a big tree ring, a wide tree ring or an arrow, and they can really pin it down so that when they do these studies on, on a house, they can tell you if the house, if the trees for the frame were felled in the spring or the fall and, and the, the year. So it's amazing how they can um, figure out that the, the years that the, the frame was uh, made from the trees that they had felled. They, and, and they didn't save the, the beams for very long. They started building when the, the uh, trees were green because they were easier to cut. They didn't have power tools back then. So if they put the frame up and cut the, the tree up, uh, it was easier when it when it was green. So if they if in the spring, um, if the te trees tested to have been felled in the spring, you can usually figure out that 
during the summer, they were probably working on building the house. So I really am um, concerned about doing the research and, and getting, getting the right date. From the deeds are not always accurate because houses burned, houses were torn down, they were moved. So if the deed says it's a house on a lot, it doesn't mean that it's the house necessarily that's there now, that something might have happened to the early one. And sometimes you find pieces of uh, uh, beams that are recycled from the early house into the house that was built later because they, they tried to reuse everything that they could. So uh, that is uh, one of my missions is uh, spreading the word about how to, how to research the houses, how to restore them and what's, what's appropriate because there, there are fads in, in restoration that are not appropriate, such as exposing beams. These houses I'm going to talk about today uh, had beams that were exposed. They were, had heavy frames and the beams were exposed. But after 1730, uh, everything was much more refined and things had progressed in, in the colonies. Uh, so there was more refinement and, and lovely paneling and so forth. And so if a house is built after around 1830, you shouldn't be pulling down the ceiling and, and exposing the beams. You shouldn't be getting the paint off the floor and sanding the floors with with heavy sanders that are going to rip up the old the old pine boards. So people are, these are fads, everybody loves beams, but pulling down the ceilings to expose them, you're really doing damage to the house. So uh, the, the teacher comes out in me because I was a teacher in another life. And, and so when I'm talking about these houses, I, I can't help but try to um, make people aware of some of the things that they should be uh, paying attention to. So with that, um, we'll look at some of the, the pictures and I'll tell you about the houses. This house is maybe the oldest house in Gloucester and Rockport. It has not had the dendrochronology to uh, ascertain the date, but if you look at the roof, it's very, very steep. And that's the sign of an early house. The left-hand side of the house, including the front door is the oldest part. And when you have a house that's this old, they have a what's called a summer beam, the main support of the house that goes across the ceiling. And they're, they're very big and chunky. And you can see this is the summer beam going into the wall with some wallpaper on it. And that uh, first period house has what they call a decorated frame. If a beam was meant to be exposed, it was decorated with, with some fancy carving on the edge, some more fancy than others. This is a terrific summer beam. Summer, by the way, uh, is comes from the French sommier, uh, beast of burden. It was a, the beast that held the house up. And you can see that this one is quarter round and where it ends, <clears throat> there's a little carving called a, <clears throat> a lamb's tongue stop. In other words, instead of just stopping that quarter round chamfer is what it's called, they finished it off with a little bit of a flourish. And so this is the, the best of a decorated frame. You can see that someone tried to strip it and there's the residue of paint uh, all, all over it. This is on the second floor where it's still a, a very nice beam with a very nice flat chamfer. And a, and a rather simple lamb's tongue stop. It does look like a tongue, but the upstairs was not as fancy as the downstairs. So that, that room downstairs got the really 
a beautiful uh, summer beam. That's as good as, as it gets, actually. Now, this is a, a gun, what they call a gunstock post on the second floor of this house. And you can see how it fans out because it was meant to hold uh, different beams coming from different uh, parts of the house and converging there. So this, uh, uh, it widens out so that it can hold several, several beams if it needs to. And these are the stairs to the cellar. They're called punching stairs and they're just half logs stacked up, very, very, very crude. And you can see all of the stones on the left. That's the base of, of the chimney. Uh, unfortunately, the chimney and fireplaces upstairs are, are gone, but uh, that's what the base looked like. Some of them were 12 feet square, 12 by 12. Uh, the bases of the chimneys were, were big and the fireplaces were, were big. This house is in Anasquam, it's the Herodon house. And this one has recently had dendrochronology. And the oldest part, which I think is to the left of the front door, I believe, um, is, is, was dated by the dendro, through the dendrochronology to 1690. It's called the Edward Herodon house, but Edward Herodon actually died in the 1680s. So uh, it must have been the next generation that built the house. And when you see a chimney uh, coming out at the ridge pole, and it's a little wider uh, along the ridge pole than, than the front to back dimension, and that usually indicates that it was a one room deep house when it was built. Um, in other words, there, was a, uh, there were two rooms, one on either side of the front door. One was called the hall, which was the English term for um, the great hall, uh, the kitchen really where everybody um, gathered and all of the cooking and everything was, everything was done in, in the hall. And the other side, uh, was called the parlor. So an early house would have, uh, one room would be the hall or kitchen. The other room would be the parlor. And on the second floor, there would be two, two bed chambers is what they call them. And the one over the, over the hall would be the hall chamber. And the one on the other side would be the parlor chamber. And you see how the windows are tucked up very high under the eaves. That's um, a sign of an early house. And as time went by, uh, the, there got to be more space between the top of the window and, and the eaves. So, so this is a house that has been added on uh, on both sides of the front, front door. So that now it's a very big house, but it probably started out as just the left side, one room down and one room up, and, and then the other side added, and then another little bit added on e either end. So this house has grown from a little house to a big house, but the oldest part has been officially dated 1690. And other than that one, and the one that I showed you before, those are the only two houses on Cape Ann that, that I think you can safely say are first period houses from the 17th century, which is the 1600s. And all of the rest of them are going to be later. Here's an old picture taken years ago of the uh, Harridan house. And there again, you can see the, the skinny chimney, wide but skinny on the depth, uh, called a William and Mary chimney. And, and here too, you can see the steep roof, which is um, typical of a 17th century house. Uh, the houses were thatch, the roofs were thatch in England, and they were very steep. And these houses were built by Englishmen. And so they, they brought their building style with them. This is a familiar house. It's uh, right on Washington Street. It's double exposure. And these houses are somewhat 
uh, in chronological order. Uh, I don't guarantee it, but somewhat. This house is dated 1700. And something different happened about that time. They stopped uh, doing building the typical timber frame house. And they started building houses with planks. Usually, if you take the clubboards off your house, you see horizontal sheathing. But what they did, uh, starting around 1700, in Gloucester, not everywhere, but in Gloucester and Rockport, they, they took big planks and they laid them side by side vertically. And they went up to the second floor and the, the beams up there uh, were had a what they call a rabbit, R-A-B-B-E-T, maybe two Ts, I'm not sure. Um, and so these big planks were inserted into this groove and then they were pegged or nailed at the second floor level and then again down at the sill at the bottom. And on the inside, there was no wall space, no interior wall space. On the inside, there, there was um, nailed to those planks were short uh, lengths of, of oak. It was called ribbon lath. And then the plaster was placed on top of that ribbon lath. And that's all there was. The club was on the outside, the, the vertical, uh, planks, and then on the inside, the uh, the uh, the ribbon lath and the plaster. And as time went by, all of those big beams were out of style, and people were tired of them. And so, what happened was they built the walls out inside, and and with new studs and modern, more modern lath and plaster so that you had a room within a room. And during the Victorian period and all through the 19th century, uh, these houses that were probably pretty cold to live in uh, were, were built out. And, and all of those beams and all of that early material were, were covered up into what was a, a mod, much more modern house. So, um, so that, that if you take the clapboards off on some of these houses, you uh, you see the vertical planks. And I don't know if I have, oh, um, you know, this, this house is one of the Riggs houses. It's also plank framed. Its original chimney is gone. Um, but there again, you see uh, this, this house is around 1700. Uh, it hasn't been tested or anything, but it, it has a steep roof and here they've added a lean-to. Sometimes the lean-to was built when the house was built, but more often after they had the, the hall and the parlor and they wanted to expand, they expanded with a salt box lean-to, which gave them um, a new room in the back. The kitchen had previously been in the front room and now the kitchen moved to the rear of the house where it has remained pretty much ever since. Here's the same house. I think this is a great picture. The, these, some of these pictures are mine and some of these are, are the courtesy of the Cape Ann Museum. This is a typical uh, old house. This is the same house in the, that was in the previous picture. And, and it, this is near Goose Cove. And you can see the laundry and, and kind of a messy yard, but, but this was a typical old farmstead. And here is the summer beam here, um, very nicely done. The, the proud owner of this house must have worked like crazy to get all of the years of accumulated paint off. And, and give this a, a furniture finish, which it, I don't necessarily advocate, but you can see how carefully that this, these beams were not rough. You didn't get splinters from these beams. Uh, the ones that are being exposed now when you pull down the ceiling are usually pretty crude with ads marks and so forth. But um, 
you can see how precisely done this is and what a beautiful lamb's tongue stop it has on the left hand end. So um, very, very good, but it, it doesn't, you don't need to strip them and refinish them like a piece of furniture as, as this did, but um, we can certainly get a good look at it. This is the God House at Halibut Point. Uh, the Gambrel Roof, this is a Gambrel Roofed House, and these were second period, not first period. But my understanding is that the early 17th century house is somewhere inside of there. And, and the house was enlarged and updated in, in the 1700s. Um, I don't know what what date, but uh, is, I think it's pretty well documented that there is something very, very early in there, but that's not what we're seeing on the outside. I've, I've never been in, I'd like to. This is the, the house that in Lanesville, down, down a lane actually, but this was the home of Deacon James Lane. Uh, I think he was a brother to John Lane for whom uh, Lanesville was named. Um, John Lane had his land around Lanes Cove. And this is uh, just a little distance away from there. And it's early, it's early 18th century. I don't know the exact date. Um, I think that people that have owned it have thought that it was in the 1600s, but um, it, it probably wasn't. They have recently added on to this house, and instead of spoiling the lines of the original house, they they left them uh, and and did this addition at right angles to the house, so that the house still has its own identity and and stands on its own, which I always like. And these are are this is a. a a, a beam, a corner beam, I, I believe. And you can see how gutsy they have to be because these other big beams are all converging there. So uh, you can tell that a, a, an early house, an early house will have very heavy beams. If the beams are not really heavy, it's not really first period. And one of my friends, uh, if somebody is telling her that a house is a first period house and it really isn't, her answer is, does it look like the Whipple house? If you've been in the Whipple house in Ipswich, you know what the feeling of those very, very, very heavy beams and there's just no mistaking it. And that the Whipple house is from the uh, 17th century or the 1600s. This is Wellspring. Wellspring was the Jacob Davis house and it was um, built about 1708. And it is really a very, very good house in a good state of, of preservation. And the way they are using it, the old part of the house is not uh, getting heavy use. They, they have their activities in the, the newer additions, which is great because there's not a lot of wear and tear on, on the old house. And that, that house was brought back from really uh, ruins. Here it is probably in the 1920s. And, and just look at it. Um, it looks like it's falling. Even the front door is crooked. Uh, there was a story, there was um, a black family that lived there. And the last one was uh, Hattie Johnson. And I guess there was a fire around the chimney and the fire department came and put it out and Hattie just rocked in her rocking chair and, and didn't even leave the house. And the fire chief said to her, Hattie, why, why don't you go somewhere where you can be more, more comfortable? Why do you stay here? And she said, sentiment, just sentiment. So the, um, one of the signs of a plank framing 
is a little overhang on the gable end. So if you look on the right, you can see uh, a line which where there's just a little bit of overhang up where that uh, triangle is. Uh, there is a, a lower one also, but it's the upper one that tells you that it's a, a plank framed house because that's where the the beam is with the rabbit to receive the the planks. This is the White Ellery house before it had any work done on it. Uh, it seems like yes, just yesterday that it, it looked like this, but it uh, doesn't look like that any, anymore really because there's been very good uh, restoration go on there. And th that house, uh, the White Ellery house at the circle on Washington Street has had dendrochronology and it was dated to 1710. And that's exactly uh, what the deeds had, had told us. Um, so this is a case of where the, the appropriate date was on there, 1710, and the dendrochronology confirmed it exactly. And here it is when it was being recited and the new casement windows put in, which would be original. And of course, now the staging is gone, uh, it's, but it's looking quite good. The, the inside will remain as it is because it, it's a study house. So it's not going to be furnished or decorated. It's going to remain like this so that students of architecture or historians can go there and, and, and see the, the, uh, the, the real bones of, of the house. This is an old picture that this house was moved. It was, it would have been almost in the rotary and it, it would have been lost, but it was moved over to where it is now. And usually these old houses had, were right on the ground. They didn't have any kind of a, of a foundation, but you can see this has kind of a high foundation. I think it's probably because it was right there by the marsh and, and probably elevated out of uh, because the tide would come in uh, and, and get really threaten it. So uh, that some of that land there is still land. So the area from where, from Washington Street over to where Friendly's was, um, it, it was quite, quite wet. Here's a picture of the White Ellery House. Uh, in the 1800s when the Ellery's was still living there. And you it had been built out so that uh, there was, I think there was wallpaper. You can't really see it very well there, but um, it had Victoria, it still had the frame there, what, but the decoration and everything was uh, uh, as disguising it and making it look like a, a proper Victorian parlor. They didn't know what year this picture was taken, but uh, this this is the front door, and the child is holding a doll, and the doll is absolutely um, 1870 dolls. So some of us who were are collectors of of antique dolls uh, were able to identify the doll and therefore date the uh, the, the picture. This is the White Ellery staircase. And for 1710, this is very fancy because many of the staircases were just enclosed with uh, boards called sheathing and did not have a, a railing. This is called um, a closed string rail because the balusters don't go down into the steps. They go down into that covering that covers the side of the steps. The, um, the rail is molded so that it fits your hand very nicely. If you're ever in the White Ellery house when it's open, put your hand around that railing and it's molded to, to be very comfortable. 
And here's uh, one of the summer beams in the White Ellery House. And it, it's like the um, house in West Gloucester. It has the quarter round chamfer and, and the lamb's tongue stop. And also on, it's going into the uh, beam called the girt over the fireplace. And you can see how the, they also uh, carved uh, that beam as well. But this house was built for the minister. So this was, a, a, even though these beams look like they should have been a little earlier, uh, this, this house was, was a rich man's house. It was built for the minister. And so it, it had details that you wouldn't find in, in the average house. But you can see how rough the, uh, uh, the beam is with a lot of uh, remnants of old paint on it. So you can imagine what those other homeowners did to get those beams cleaned off. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to tackle that. Uh, this is an, another uh, picture of the White Ellery House um, with the summer beam. And, and the chimney girt. This one doesn't look quite as rough as the other one. It may be in another room that is less um, crude. And these, this is a, uh, you get the, in the back of those short pieces are the vertical, you maybe can see a, at the bottom of a vertical seam. And those are the ribbon lath, the little short oak laths. And, and the plaster right on them. So there you're looking at, at the, the whole sandwich that, that put the house together. No place to put electric wiring or insulation or, or anything. It was a very thin wall and uh, it soon became old fashioned and probably very, very cold, I would guess. This house is uh, the old castle in Pigeon Cove, which is open occasionally. And this has had dendro, uh, dendro chronology. Everybody shortened it to dendro. And I think that this is um, around 18, 1710 to 12. Uh, it's, it's very much first period. It's owned by, I think maybe the uh, Rockport Historical Society, yeah, but it's it's a museum house. It's open on occasion. This is the famous witch house in Pigeon Cove. Uh, you may be familiar with it. Uh, the story is that one of the uh, accused women in Salem that was supposed to be hanged was brought by her family to Rockport and hidden in this house. And this story has prevailed and it was always called the, the witch house. Everybody knows it as the witch house. However, uh, the, the house was built between 1709 and 1712 and the witchcraft and the hangings and so forth uh, were in, in 1692. So, um, so the the so-called witch. She wasn't a witch, of course, but uh, the the poor soul that was brought to Rockport, if she was, was not housed in, in this house. What is interesting about this is that one of the rooms is built with squared logs. There were some squared log buildings in southern New Hampshire and over into Maine. There are three in Massachusetts and they're all on Cape Ann. This is one of them. And I will uh, point out the others as, as well. Uh, so that particular part of the house that's log is, is very rare. One of three in Rockport and Gloucester and uh, none others in the state of Massachusetts. This is a sad story. This is on Wheeler Point. It's the old Wheeler house. And um, it has been modernized until it 
looks more like a, a, a subdivision house than, than what it did look like. They removed the chimney completely and replaced it with zero clearance fireplaces. And if you look at that chimney, it's really just a box and you can see the uh, pipes for the blues for the uh, zero clearance fireplaces coming out the, the top of it. Um, there, the previous owners were very concerned about what was going to happen to that house after they sold it. And they talked to me a couple of times and I urged them to uh, put it into the custody of historic New England. Um, but that, that would protect it forever, but it would cost quite a lot to, uh, you'd have to give it an endowment. And they, they didn't do it. They did have something written in the deed that said the house couldn't be moved or torn down and um, that the paneling and the staircase, I think, should remain. The chimney was not mentioned. The chimney, uh, is the heart and soul of an early house. Uh, an early house that's lost its chimney has lost uh, a big important piece. And so this one no longer has its uh, chimney, which is sad, but, uh, but this is, uh, I don't know, may maybe 17, 10 to 15, some somewhere in there, perhaps it has not had gender or chronology, which would have been money better spent than tearing out the, the chimney. This is an older picture of it. And you can see when it had the chimney. It, it has been a restaurant, it's been a gift shop, it's uh, got quite a, quite a history. And there it is from the back, you can see the long sloping roof of of the lean-to on the back, the salt box, and it's right on the, the water. And here's the very nice staircase. And like the White Ellery House, it has the closed string. The balusters are not going down to the steps, but they're but to that cover board. And this is, uh, the Haskell House in West Gloucester. The uh, Cape Ann Museum, uh, and it, it wasn't called Cape Ann Museum at the time, but owned it for a long, long, or long ago, they owned it for a short time. And I guess that they didn't get much traffic over there to, to have it as a museum house. It's, it's off the beaten path and it's been very expertly restored. So it was um, getting into a little rough shape, but it has been restored to perfection uh, with guidance from uh, a lot of professionals to be sure that it was done right. And there again, there was a time when this house was dated 1650. I would date it probably 1715. And Nobody has done the dendro on it. I think sometimes people would rather rather um, wish that it was the early date and and not burst their bubble and and find out that it's much newer because i I think that this is uh, it's it's the first period house and it's plank framed, but I do think that it's in the 1700s, not sixteen. Uh, I was there when they uh, removed a clapboard to find out if it was plank framed. And there you can see the vertical planks. They're uh, very much in evidence. And I expected that that's what they would find. And they certainly did. Here it is after they stripped it uh, to put new clapboards on and, and new windows. And you can see the um, the planks, and um, in some cases you can tell. Uh, I, I don't have a pointer, but there are patches where originally there had been uh, leaded casement windows that 
uh, had different sizes. So when they put in these modern, more modern um, double hung windows, they had to uh, fill in where the casements had, had been. And here, here is the interior. You can see once again, as a big heavy corner post to hold those other beams that are resting on it. Uh, this room uh, has a very tiny serpentine chamfer uh, on, on the beams, it's a summer beam particularly, which is very unusual. I, the only other one I've seen is in the witch house. Uh, so in the witch house we, we know is 17, 10 to 12. So if, if this house turned out to be in that same uh, area uh, or the same date, I wouldn't be surprised. This house is 528 Washington Street. It's on the Mel River. It's down a little bit off the road. It's around 1718. And you can see very clearly there's a little overhang uh, above the second floor indicating the plank framing. The, uh, it, it belonged to the wharf family, nothing to do with having a wharf or owning a wharf on the water, their, their name was actually war. And they, uh, this is one of their homes. And I've, uh, somebody that I knew bought this house maybe 30, 35 years ago, and they were doing some rewiring and they broke a hole in the wall and they looked in the wall with a flashlight and they saw uh, plaster, another plaster behind it and early 18, uh, 1800s wallpaper. So they, they called me to come over and take a look. And I realized that this was the plank frame house that had been built out it probably was freezing cold there by the water and the walls had been built out and the old wall and plaster and wallpaper still existed um, uh, uh, behind the, the newer wall. Well, it, the house was sold and somebody uh, really got gutted it, unfortunately, and the paneling and all the evidence and everything that was there went in the dumpster. Uh, and I'm sure that it's a very comfortable house now, but it here it is. Um, it, it doesn't any longer look like 1718, but I'm I'm sure it's very nice. But people like me don't like to see that material, the paneling, and everything go into the dumpster. This picture, this is the house. It, this is from the late 1800s, probably, 19th century. And this is the, the same house on 528 Washington Street. You can see the little overhang up at the top. And, but look at the rocks. Look at, there's no other houses around it. Um, 150 years ago, that's what it looked like. Um, hardly recognizable. I think it's a great picture. And it doesn't have as big a staircase as the White Ellery House, but it does have a very nice staircase. And you can see that short length of closed string with the balusters going down into the, uh, the cover that covered this, this stringer. So that was quite a quite a nice uh, feature of that house. And I, I think it survived, I think it's still there. And this is the corner there after they had uh, pulled out all of the Victorian framing and so forth. Now squared log construction, um, uh, none of the, uh, well, yes, the witch house has been dated. Uh, and it has that one section of squared log. Um, the other one in Rockport is this uh, Joshua Norwood cottage. And look at the very steep roof. 
And this house is squared logs. I haven't been in. I haven't seen it. It hasn't been um, uh, had dendro chronology, but I was told that it was in very good good hands and in good condition, which is nice to hear. There's an older picture of it. Uh, I think it was moved there. It was out by the water somewhere. It's on the corner of, um, oh, now I can't, uh, Mount Pleasant and uh, is it Atlantic or Water Street? I, I forget, but um, it's right there in downtown Rockport, just as you start up Mount Pleasant Street. It's on a corner, very charming. This is the uh, Thomas Riggs house. For years, this was called the oldest house in Gloucester. What is old is the right-hand end that is squared logs, like, like the witch house and like the Norwood cottage. Um, it, has, it has not had dendro, it has not been dated, but the um, gambrel part of the house was added and um, I think 1753 or four, that is well documented, not by Dendro, but by the in information and in some of the old uh, deeds and wills. And so this has uh, been nicely restored and it's on Vine Street. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in that house and it's uh, uh, for many years, it was, just used in the summer and very hard to get to. You had to go up a driveway and by through somebody's backyard to get to it. But then it was sold and now it has its own driveway from Vine Street and has all the modern conveniences, but the um, antiquity has been thoroughly preserved. There's the, the little end, the, the squared logs, like the, the uh, Norwood Cottage. The, here is the fireplace that's in the kitchen of the gambrel part. Uh, there's some question as there, there might have been an intermediate uh, addition to this house after the squared logs, maybe. They expanded it a little bit, and then years later did the, the whole uh, gambrel roof section. Uh, but this is a almost 10 foot uh, cooking fireplace. And you can see in the right hand corner, there's the door to the, the beehive oven that they baked in. Unfortunately, there are houses in Gloucester and Rockport that have been demolished that shouldn't have been, but it happened. This house is a Dolliver house. <clears throat> it's on Main Street. Uh, it's right next to where the construction is going on, where Cameron's was. This house was um, uh, quite early. It has the, you can see, Behind the tree, uh, it had an overhang uh, indicating plank framing. And it, it was a very good house. And it was before it was demolished, it was moved back on the lot. And the, um, there was a, a diner uh, put in the front yard. And I'm not talking about the diner that's there on the corner of Chestnut Street now. Uh, it, the diner that was here was moved to Danvers Port, and there is it's still there operating. Uh, I think it's Route 35, and if you look at it on the front of the diner, it says Cape Ann. It was the Cape Ann Diner. So there were actually two diners right there uh, in the area of Chestnut Street in, in Gloucester. So... Um, uh, this house, uh, when it was it was for sale, and it was going to become the headquarters of the Red Cross for I don't know if it was Massachusetts or Essex County, 
but there were great plans for it. It was going to be restored and it was going to be the headquarters of the Red Cross. And things were moving along until um, whoever the, the head honcho in Washington uh, said no, and the house was demolished, which was a, a really a, a tragedy. It was always considered the oldest house in downtown Gloucester, and it, it probably was. This is the parlor there. And it's not a very good picture, but some descendants that live in North or South Carolina uh, sent me these picture copies of these pictures. And, and so this is what we've got. But that mantle around the fireplace is much later. It's a hundred years later than the uh, house itself. And the design of that mantle indicates that it was um, done by Samuel McIntyre of Salem, which would make it a very, very rare uh, fireplace mantle and you know, worth a lot of money and very beautiful and a lot going for it. And the record says that one of the workmen took it home to install it in his house. And I don't know who he was and I don't know where his house is, but if anybody recognizes it, please let me know. I've been wondering for years where that mantle is. And also that little chest of drawers on the left of the fireplace is very, very choice. But the house is gone and everything dispersed. This house was on uh, Prospect Street. The, the little gambrel on the left, the small one, is 92 Prospect Street. I think this was 96 or 98 Prospect Street. It was moved um, to, um, or, or my label says 96 Prospect Street, um, moved in the 1890s by uh, the, the mayor of Newburyport, who was a house mover. And whoops, um, I'm getting ahead of myself. Here, here it is. Um, it was moved to Fear Street off Friends Street. And it was, it's been demolished. And it, it was quite an interesting house. It was plank framed. It had been renovated. There was uh, somebody who owned it around 1800 named Samuel French, who was a house right. And the staircase and a lot of what was in there was from that period. So I assume he's the one that did it. But anyway, we tried to find um, different people in Gloucester, tried to find a buyer for, for the house that would take it down and re-erect it somewhere else. But the time ran out and the house was bulldozed. This is a house that's long gone. Uh, this was on Little River uh, off, uh, uh, off uh, uh, Essex Avenue. And it was way down a long driveway. Uh, it was called the, the Preston House or the it looks like Evelis, but actually they pronounced it Evely. So the Evely Preston house at Little River, it was a very fine house. I believe that it was exactly like Wellspring. And you can see the double overhangs on, on the end. And uh, there are peaks at the vertical planks. And it supposedly people used to uh, go up Little River on a Sunday for a picnic. And that was kind of a, a picnic spot where people would, would go up Little River and, and uh, enjoy being by the water. But that, that would, would be a house that would be so exciting if it was still standing and, and it's not. It probably would have been around 1700, not much after. Oh, I, I've been interested in houses for a very long time. And when I was quite young, 
I got a Viewmaster for Christmas. And one of the pictures on the, one of the reels for the Viewmaster was the oldest timber frame house um, uh, in um, America. But I think what I'm gonna show you here is the oldest timber framed house in Massachusetts and maybe New England, which is the Fairbanks house in uh, Dedham. And you can you can ju just look at it. You can tell it is ancient. It, it's been dated, uh, some of it as early as, or some of the timbers anyway, as early as 1637. And I think most of it more like 1641 or two. And it is the oldest uh, frame house in, in America. Uh, is it timber framed? And this is what I was going, this is a joke on, on me. As I was starting to tell you, I had this reel with a picture of America's oldest house. And I maybe I was 12 years old when I got that for Christmas. And I always wanted to see America's oldest house. So a couple of years ago, I went to St. Augustine, where the, the old America's oldest house was, and I really wanted to see it. So we looked around St. Augustine and we had lunch, and then we went to look at the house. Well, it was a long way from where we were parked, and we walked and walked and walked, and I had uncomfortable shoes on, and my feet started to bleed and hurt, and, and we kept plodding along and plodding along and we finally got there by the time we got there and here's the sign the oldest house i was absolutely so tired that i didn't even care about going in i i cared i wasn't interested in anything except resting somewhere and and then um my son who was making fun of me uh went inside and got a brochure to bring out and I started to look at the brochure and it admitted that the early date had been wrong all the time and the house was really 1740s, which means that all of the houses I've shown you today are older than this one. So I, I uh, finally had the satisfaction of seeing America's oldest house, which is not America's oldest house, but the, um, the biggest number of early houses uh, is in New England and a lot of, of them in Massachusetts. So that concludes my story of first period houses in Gloucester, 17, uh, 1680 to 1730. So uh, as you drive around, look for that little overhang on some of the early houses. Uh, just recently, there was a building for sale on Eastern Avenue and on the corner of Fair Street. And it was just a funny little building. It wasn't that old or anything, but as I was looking at houses for sale, I noticed that the house next door had uh, that little overhang. And it's a house that I'm, I don't know its history, but if you keep your eyes open, I guess maybe there are, are a few that haven't been discussed, that uh, haven't been uh, researched or discovered. So uh, I'm always anxious to hear about uh, finding something that we don't have documented. So that concludes my story of the oldest houses on Cape Ann, Gloucester and Rockport, including West Gloucester. So I, I hope you uh, learn some things so that as you drive around, you keep your eyes open. One day I was, uh, I had given a talk and some, a long time later, I was checking out at the market and all of a sudden somebody behind me said, that's the lady that's going to cause me to have a, a, an accident with my car. She, I'm driving around looking at chimneys and I'm going to probably have an accident. So. Don't be careful, but keep your eyes open. <laughs> Thank you.